Hello, my name is Todd Patinsky, and I'm pleased to be a part of the panel and more generally the IASC Winter School. I'm joining the Institute from Stony Brook University, part of the State University of New York on the East Coast of the United States. And if you look slightly to the right of Mark Zuckerberg, uh, that's me. So again, thank you for the invitation to be part of the panel. And hello to my fellow panelists and to the audience. My remarks today are going to focus on a particular thread within the larger context of false narratives on social media. And in particular, I'm going to speak to the ways that extremist forces strategically use social media and spread false narratives. And I'm going to speak to both the challenge, the great challenge that this poses to democratic well-being. In addition, some of the possibilities. And I'm going to bracket my remarks as speaking directly to the US context. And I'll at points point out why it is that I think some of the false narrative challenges and the possibilities are specific to specific regions and specific countries. I debated how much to focus on the content of the narratives. It's a bit uncomfortable to give them airplay, but I wanted to underscore that there's institutions, and in this case, networks like QAnon, and there are also influential individuals. And in this case, I'm underscoring a recently elected parliamentarian in the United States, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has a history of spreading false narratives online, including Pizzagate, which is a, uh, it's a conspiracy theory that uh, elite U.S. politicians and business people are engaged in child trafficking out of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., as far-fetched as that sounds. And to the left of that, you see one of the other false narratives and dangerous narratives that she's spread on social media, which is that the very destructive California wildfires which ravaged much of uh, central and northern California were caused by satellites controlled by an international Jewish cabal. And so we have not only institutions like QAnon, but we have individual actors who are promulgating the spread. Now is a particularly important time to both try and understand and to combat false narratives online, because what we see in the wake of the disruption and pain caused by the pandemic are false narratives promulgating, which try and take advantage of the dislocation, the disruption, and the pain to gain followership of theories of international elites, like the World Economic Forum, conspiring that is strategically using the pandemic, as well as a, in the narrative's view, a crisis, they put it in quotes, around climate change to try and institute a great reset. And so it's a particularly worrisome time because with all of the pain and disruption caused by the pandemic, more and more sectors of the population are potentially at risk of falling prey to these narratives. I'd like, the first half, I'd like to talk about the degree to which this really is a great problem. And it's great in the sense of large, worrisome, huge. And I'm going to suggest some of the reasons why I believe that it's not something that's going to be easily combated. One reason, one big reason, 
would be the rate of spread of false narratives online. Specifically, the fact that they can spread exponentially on social media platforms, indeed like wildfire. And I wanna underscore here that this is partly intentional because algorithms on social media are designed intentionally to feed people who show an interest in certain news, similar feeds. And so they feed those who have an interest in false narratives who quote unquote like them more false narratives. And this is not something that's coincidental. It's actually the intent, which is to capitalize on individuals' preferences to keep them in the network longer. A second reason this is such a great problem relates to the idea of platform migration. And so should we prove successful at cracking down on false narratives on one social media platform, adherents can easily scramble to others. And even if some of the big platforms were to take false narratives seriously, these narratives would likely survive in darker, less regulated, and corners of the internet with even more extreme content. So networks like Gab, Parler, Telegram, I would also like to underscore here that while we often focus on social media, in addition, false nav narratives are promulgating quite quickly on podcasts and eBooks. And those two are developing the capability to be viral as the notion of what is an eBook evolves. And so we're soon gonna be confronted with the challenge of viral podcasts and viral eBooks. A third reason false narratives on social media are such a great problem relates to the fact that global centralized influencers are intentionally promulgating them. So for example, in the US, we're confronted with Russian backed accounts that are amplifying and have been amplifying the QAnon movement as early as it started. And so one research program, for example, found that QAnon was the single most frequent hashtag tweeted by Russian backed accounts. And in the US, researchers tied false narratives back to Russia, China, Iran, and the Ukraine, among other places. And I wanna underscore that these global centralized influencers are both trying to promulgate specific agendas, such as trying to, uh, trying to tilt elections in the favor of certain candidates. But in addition, they're trying to simply sow discord. And that becomes very tricky and that can help explain why we see competing narratives, often false narratives, but the intent there is to simply undermine confidence in democratic institutions like elections. And so it becomes quite tricky because the challenge, the grand challenge and problem is not to combat any one narrative, but indeed to try and restore order to a series of chaotic narratives. It's important I would emphasize that while we must consider globalized centralized influencers, we have to recognize that it's largely a decentralized problem too, which contributes to the challenge. And if you look on the left, you see a simple graph modeling a centralized influencer. But in addition, we have a network influence with false narratives. And by that, I mean individual actors, ordinary Twitter users, fuel the momentum of false narratives. Friends share narratives online, and by extension, friends share false narrative with friends. And so while it's often the case that we talk about the role of global centralized influencers, individual actors, ordinary social media users, undeniably fuel the great momentum of false narratives online. 
Combating false narratives on social media is further challenged by the fact that these narratives evolve. Indeed, there's a constant evolution that presents challenges for platforms and governments and other actors who are trying to combat false narratives, false hashtags, because these are continuously appropriated and reappropriated. So the target of what might, one might hope to counter is constantly morphing, constantly evolving, and constantly shifting. And as it evolves, it gains what many followers of false narratives see as almost a historical authenticity, because often narratives incorporate aspects of earlier narratives, which gives them a certain grounding and communicates to those who are prone to believe them a certain authenticity. So the evolving nature of the social media narratives that are dangerous and false further complicates the challenge of combating them. Finally, it's a great problem and a challenging problem because these false narratives spill over from social media to our physical world. They spill over from the internet into the real world. And very often the response is after the fact and we're playing catch up. And so the challenge of combating false narratives on social media is not simply one of creating a more virtuous online space, but it's to try and stem the dangerous spillover and effects of false narratives online in our physical world. With those six reasons reviewed for why the problem is such a great one, I'd like to turn now to the possibilities for US citizens to try and combat false narratives on social media. And I'd suggest that while there are many, many reasons it's a great problem, the possibilities for action are fairly prescribed and really distilled down into four. First, concerned citizens might call for greater self-regulation by the social media companies. In effect, they could call for organizations to self-censor their communities more. Almost all social media companies already do have in place terms of service and acceptable use policies that say that they regulate the activities. And while the US has the First Amendment, the First Amendment speaks primarily, if not overwhelmingly to government action. And so it's probably, or most legal experts believe, it's probably not a violation of free speech in the United States if social media companies were to self-regulate more. But while greater self-regulation or calling for greater self-regulation may be legal, I would argue it's both ineffective or largely ineffective and undesirable. So we see self-regulation self has been in place and yet false narratives promulgate ever more. But in addition, I would argue it's undesirable and that possibly the only thing worse for democracy than false narratives spreading with the efficiency of social media would be ad hoc censorship by unelected and largely unaccountable companies. It simply put too big of a power for private companies. And I put the photo of German Chancellor Angela Merkel because she has come out and said as much in a critique of the deplatforming of President Trump in the United States. Again, the it being that it's a power too great to leave to private companies. A further worrisome aspect of calling for greater self-regulation by social media companies would be the fact 
that self-regulation is ripe for exploitation. And if we take this example, that of Trump's wide-scale deplatforming, it came after he was politically weaker and a new administration was imminent. And so the possibility of self-regulation is ripe for exploitation and can and currently is being used against politically vulnerable dissidents. Social media companies already censor free speech all the time at the request of governments. And I put here a photo of Russian dissident Navalny because he too has criticized a reliance on greater self-regulation. And so we see critiques of the self-regulation model, particularly in the case of what to do in the wake of Trump's deplatforming, coming from many different corners of society, but corners that are passionate about democratic governance. The second possibility for citizens in the US who are concerned about the spread of false narratives on social media might be to call for greater government regulation. And this is what most of Europe does and is likely to do more of, both at the constituent government level as well as the EU. But such a model is very unlikely to work in the United States because the US has the First Amendment which is a uniquely American commitment to severely limit government intervention in speech, and in particular, protects speech that might be construed as political, which false narratives often speak to political topics of the day. So while in theory, passionate US citizens who are concerned about the threat of false narratives might wish to call for greater government regulation. Such regulation, if tried, is unlikely to su survive challenges in the courts and ultimately the US Supreme Court. This brings us to a third option, a third route that citizens, concerned citizens might pursue, which would be to drop off big platforms like Facebook or Twitter or potentially to drop out altogether of social media. This approach has both individual costs though, the cost of giving up the everyday conveniences and connections that social media enables. But in addition, I would argue this has a tremendous collective downside because it would contribute to the further social fragmentation of discourse and undermine even further the ability for coexistence across the ideological spectrum in the United States. So while a conceivable possibility, that of individuals dropping off and dropping out, in practice this approach sacrifices much of what individuals appreciate from social media, but in addition has the collective downside of further social fragmentation. This brings me to the fourth and final option that I would posit is available to citizens who are concerned about the spread of false narratives online and the threat they pose to democratic governance. And it would be to be an upstander online. And by that I mean to be a good citizen. So in general, we think of upstanders as people who speak and act proactively and positively in support of the individuals and causes that are important, particularly on behalf of vulnerable populations. And certainly in our offline communities, upstanders are essential to the functioning of healthy democracies. And so by extension, we can imagine that citizens or that we collectively could work to cultivate cultures of upstanding online. And I would note that this requires dramatic changes to the norms online. But each individual acting positively and proactively could have ripple effects 
And I'm quoting here the phrase, put dents in the universe. I think it's an interesting phrase to use in this context because it shows both the ambition of individuals collectively having impact, but also the humility in the fact that we're simply making dents. I also think it's an interesting quote in this context because it's often attributed to Steve Jobs on the internet, but it's actually a fictitious quote. So it was uttered by Noah Wiley, an actor who was playing Steve Jobs, but it's become a Steve Jobs quote if you Google it. And I first encountered it in a book where it was cited back to Steve Jobs. So if in general, being an upstander online means being a proactive and a good citizen online, what that might that look like in its particularities? And I would argue that it looks like or might manifest as at least six things. First, we can and we must be more careful whom we friend. Too many users allow misinformation to spread because they've accepted an invitation or a friend request from someone who's actually a fabricated profile. The picture may look realistic and often attractive, but it's fabricated. And we must understand we open ourselves up with each like or each connection to false narratives. And further, we put our entire social networks at risk of falling prey to false narratives. So we can and must be careful whom we friend. Second, we can and must refuse to forward, like, or retweet content without carefully inspecting it. And research has shown that false narratives are often interwoven into otherwise seemingly innocuous accounts. And so if we're doing something like forwarding to our social network, or publicly liking or retweeting content, we should scrutinize that content. And we should think about and engage directly with what it is we're endorsing. Third, we can and must call out objectionable content on social media platforms, citizen to citizen. And again, if we encounter it, we should call it out with the idea that otherwise, we're tacitly accepting it. Continuing on for how individuals who are concerned about false narratives and pernicious actions online can act as upstanders online and affect good citizens of online communities, we can and we must use social media to share truthful accounts and to spread campaigns that are democratic in nature, not simply respond to pernicious and dangerous ones. We must be proactive and positive in populating online communities with quality content and not simply sit idly by. Fifth and finally, I believe in the United States, we can and we must recommit sincerely to the value and importance of liberal democracy. And liberal democracy is a big phrase. I'm referring specifically to the threat of it, which speaks to ideological diversity, the notion that a liberal democracy is large enough to hold competing ideologies. And so we need to act ideologically and not tribally. And by that, I mean we need to combat the degree to which ideology becomes identity. So in sum, a way to think about this fourth option, and the option where I've landed is the most promising, is that what others seek to destroy the democratic and truthful quality of online communities, bit by bit we each have to defend and strengthen as individual citizens, and by extension, collectively. Well, I've landed on this fourth option, Upstanders Online, 
as the one that is most viable for U.S. citizens who are worried and concerned. It is one that it would represent difficult work. First and foremost, it has to come into sharper focus. We still debate what it means to be a good citizen in traditional community. So there is much to unpack about being an upstander online or a good citizen. Next, I've discussed several ways in which the US context shapes the available options. And so the question I think that needs to be confronted is the extent to which being an upstander online is country specific. Citizenship takes different forms and has different meanings in different regions and different nations. And so by extension, we need to understand the extent to which being an upstander online may be universal or whether it may be country or nation specific. Next, and I believe some of the panelists will speak to this more directly, we'd have to grapple with and we have to confront the fact that social media companies and the corporate mandates for profit may, by their very nature, undermine the degree to which individuals can productively act as citizens. I've argued elsewhere that the proper organization of online communities is as cooperatives and not private or publicly traded companies. And finally, and perhaps most profoundly, such work would, is complicated by the fact that we don't have unlimited time. As we've seen with recent events indeed, the false narratives are only speeding up and only spilling over to greater degrees. And the constant erosion of confidence in democratic institutions in the US is only accelerating. And so there's a real question. It's not the case that such interventions have the luxury of their own timeline. I'm going to close my remarks there. I'd like to thank my fellow panelists. I'd like to thank the audience for engaging with these ideas. And I'd like to thank IASP for inviting me to be part of this year's Winter Institute. I'm including on this slide my email address. My only regret in participating is that I was unable to meet with individuals and to engage in deeper conversation around these issues. I'm sharing also a social media profile with a bit of humility, but uh, I am on social media, specifically LinkedIn. And again, by sharing the email and the LinkedIn account, it's my hope that perhaps I can connect with colleagues on these issues. I gratefully appreciate comments, questions, concerns, ideas thoughts, challenges, and perhaps the opportunity to connect online and perhaps in the future face to face. Sending all best from this corner of the world.